And we are live, people. Welcome to HESU Review. I'm Professor Jennifer Harrison Hawa. Let's get started. I have a hefty review for you. Please ask questions. Um, as always, it, it's not in compensation of everything that we've gone through because we've gone through a lot. So um, you want to make sure that for your for your test that how I would start with it, I would I would go back over the areas where um, they were a little foggy for me, go through the reviews, the, the classes are recorded, I've posted them for you. Um, you want, of course, math, 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 and then start with the areas that, that were a little bit weaker for you in concepts and then build up from there. All right, let's just get into it. All right, we'll do it this way. All right, so let me just ask you, I'm looking at Miss Ashley Blair Cunningham. Can you see my screen good? I'm always, cause like right now, like I see myself, Lisa, Budala, and it's covering the screen, but is it covering the screen or you can see the complete PowerPoint? Does that make sense? You can, you can see it. Okay, so just covering, okay. I see the faces and it's covering my part. All right, we're gonna talk today. All right, so you guys, this in, our entire class is about community health. What it is, what it does, so it's a thing. In, in order for that thing to become reality and actually make a difference, you need a person, which is your community health nurse to the rescue. So community health nursing, it is considered a specialized nursing. And all that is, is that, you know, you usually just can't walk in, you, you know, maybe you can be an intern or what have you, but you have to come in with certain skills and knowledge sets to be a community health nurse because it is so many things that, as you guys learn that we do. I was a public public health nurse on the reservation. And so and so I was under training for a long period of time. But anyway, let's get into it. So it is, it is it's considered a specialized field of nursing. The focus on community health nursing is the community. How can we make them, our community that you've defined and you did your windshield survey and you had your vulnerable populations, how can we make them, how can we promote their health? How can we help them to be as healthy as possible? So we can work in a government setting, we can work in schools as we talked about, churches, faith-based organization, but the role of a public health nurse is pretty, pretty wide. And she can't do this all by herself. So number one, not number one in this particular order, but health promotion and education. If there's nothing that we do, the community health nurse does, is she's always, regardless of where that, that community is in their prevention or diseases or what have you, she's always going to be promoting health and she's always going to be educating. That is like her thing. She's educating individuals and communities about how to um, prevent disease and make better lifestyle choices. She's going to have workshops. She's going to have education material. She's going to talk about how important nutrition is for your diabetes or for your pre-diabetes or to prevent diabetes exercise, substance abuse, she's promoting health. That is like her thing. But then she's also wanting to prevent disease and control diseases if there's if there's any in the community because we don't want it, we don't want things to spread. So then she plays a crucial role in preventing communicable diseases. Okay. So she's monitoring disease outbreaks and tracking, which is secondary, which is surveillance, okay? She's reporting cases, she's conducting investigations, she's putting measures in place to contain it, okay? Because we don't want things to spread again. They're, we're giving vaccines, we're providing immunization programs, 
that's another big piece for your, your community health nurse. But also she needs to know what she's getting into, okay? She needs to know as much about the community as possible before she even steps foot or knocks on the first door. So then she has to do some type of a, assessment. So your community assessment is your head to toe, uh, Miss Billie Jean in room 101. So instead of an individual, your folk, you're doing a head to toe on your community, which is your, your vulnerable population, your windshield survey, all of that. Those are, those are key because you wanna take that data, all right? You wanna take that information and you want to and you want to design intervention programs that are targeted. You don't want to just go out there like we're going to do this and you don't even know what you're getting into or what's already existing. You might be trying to do a program that's already there or what have you. So you have to do in a community you have to do an assessment of your patient, okay? Just like when you go into the room the first time you're assessing them before you do anything. Okay. And then Everything in life evolves around rules and regulations and policies and advocacies. That was the part I was just like, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a doer, but I know that you have to have policies and stuff and, and, and those things in place in order to be in order to be promoted and to be carried out. You know, policy this, policy that. So we advocate for policies that promote health of our communities. So we may not be actually the ones to write it out, but we're like that, you know, that horn, like we need this, we need that, we need this. So, you know, that's what we're doing. We're raising awareness about public health issues, social justice, that sort of thing. And, you know, if an emergency should arise, you know, a bombing, God, I mean, I don't wanna put anything out in the atmosphere. Emergency preparedness is another huge piece of community health nursing. And again, you're not like running around doing everything, but you're if, if something happens in your community, then they're looking for you to be like the leader. Okay. Again, so then you your emergency response preparedness, developing plans to have in place so that if a disaster should hit, then it's just a matter of you know implementing those protocols coordinating with other professionals, other agencies, local health departments, county, state, whatever needs to be done. But that is considered, you know, that's an emergency. So then you're helping get people to shelters. You know where your vulnerable folks are because you've already done your assessment. So those sort of things. And then your case managing. Your case managing and you're doing home visits. And so this is an example of where that might be individual focus when you do a home visit, but you have the community in your mind, if that makes sense at all. So yes, you are seeing individual people, but you're not doing it. Uh, your focus is not um, like a home health nurse doing a, a dressing change on somebody that had surgery the other day, because you're really just focusing on that person. But you, what the community health nurse does is that she's always keeping the, the health and well-being of the community at the back of our mind. So then um, you're promoting screenings, you're doing screenings, you're administering medications, offering support. Um, again, we're, you're still going to collaborate. Collaboration is a huge piece, again, because I was only one person but I had a plethora of resources and I knew people from being there that I could pick up the phone and call and get them to come out, do this, that, and the other, you know, check, check, test for lead um, in the home, that sort of stuff, environmental health, or what have you. You've got to know your social workers, all of that sort of thing. And so you're striving to improve the health of, I keep saying the health outcomes to prevent you're always wanting to prevent. You want to live in that primary world as much as possible. Secondary, sure, yeah. Do you want to detect stuff? Tertiary, you know, it is what it is um, because chronic diseases has taken over the United States as far as what folks are dying from opposed to our great, great, great grandparents who maybe lived in their 40s and 50s and died of the bubonic plague and stuff. It's, All right. Excuse me, Professor, are we still are you, on the same screen? I just want to be sure. Oh, yeah. I'm just, yeah, okay. I'm just <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's like, why did she digress? She has not come to my live reviews before. So then 
going back to the screen. Yeah, yeah, definitely so. So, so again, we work in homes and schools and um, and for industries and what have you. So those are three specific areas that um, that they want you to focus on as far as where you might see your public health nurse, but you can see her anywhere. Move the right screen. <laughs> Thank you so very much. All right. So then when we're looking at, let me move this around so I can I can see. I know you guys can see, but I have anybody right. All right. So then as far as your your um your public health nurse is concerned, again, we feel that we feel strongly that everyone has the natural birthright to live as healthy as possible and as long as possible. And again, we're preventing disease. Okay, that's where that's where we want to live in our in our primary um, prevention realm with our immunizations and our health education and our teachings, prolong, prolonging life wherever stage they may be. Okay, so you want to come in knowing the health status of your community, and then you want to come in knowing like what are the things that are plaguing them to begin with, and so again, we're always promoting health and working with that individual because we cannot make them make the change, but you can give them the tools that they need. So again, promoting health, improvement of physical and social environment, again, helping to bring those tools that are needed. Maybe there, there's a walking path that's needed. Maybe there's, um, you know, they don't have a, a sidewalk to safely walk in and you can advocate for those different things. All right. So, furthermore, so you're gonna we're gonna talk about data collection, data generating, and another data. I can't remember. It's on the slide. So you you need data. You need like what I like to say is like the proof is in the pudding, right? We can talk about it, but show me the numbers. So the primary goal of data collection is that you're gonna take usable information. That's the key here. And you want you want usable and reliable information about the people in the community that you are going to help. And so data collection interpretation, meaning that you're going to look at existing data that's out there. You know, you can, you know, look at your your, your health department stuff on a local level. Um you don't want state or national because that's not about your community. And then generating missing data, meaning that you want, if, if you don't know birth rates or you don't know um, what, are the, what are the conditions that are plaguing them, you need to get that information. So you want, you want to gather as much information from what's out there already. You know, do they have healthy foods in the area, healthy stores, that sort of thing. Do they have, um, where is the nearest doctor? Where is the nearest pharmacy? And then as far as um, you're using all, you're collecting and you're interpreting this, again, not by yourself. So you can identify what those, you want to do your research first so you can identify those issues that are disproportionately affecting your community. So then therefore, in the, down the road, you can be more targeted because it's, it's just you. And you know you're gonna pull help from different people or what have you, but you need to come in with that basic information knowledge so that when you do come up with your programs and targeted, it's targeted. It's not just something you're like, well, I think they have diabetes. And so there isn't any place for them you don't want to, you're going to want to spin your wheels. So you collect your data. And so then data generation is because they're, they're really big on, on terms and definitions. I always say with like, <clears throat> you know, definitions and stuff, memorize it first, because there's, again, there's the data collection and interpretation. All right. Then there's data gathering. And then there's data generation, generating. And so it's like, if you should see that, you should first know the difference. And if you know the difference and you won't be like, what's the, this all sounds the same, but it's not the same. 
So data gathering, okay, is the process of obtaining existing, reliable, readily available information. So again, this is your um, finding out what the what are the age of the residents from the youngest to the oldest. All right. So you want to know like why don't the young oldest person here is fifty five. That should be you know that's considered their older, where the average age um, uh, that the average late age of um, that people live in the United States, let's just say is 75 and it's 55 in this group. That should make your spider senses tingle. All right, socioeconomic, okay. What is the household income, median household income? Are they at the poverty level? How far below the poverty level or above the poverty level? What's the racial distribution in that area as well? You want to come in knowing mortality, what's killing folks, you know, morbidity, mortality and morbidity. Do we know the difference between mortality and morbidity? Anybody want to share? I'm trying to wake some folks up. I, I, I don't know what morbidity means, but mortality means, you know, what's going to kill you or death. All right, all right, very um, good. Morbidity refers to illness or disease. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're talking about, so morbidity, mor 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 morbidity, mortality. You know, mortality is the easy one, okay, what's killing folks. But then I like to think of morbidity as what's dragging it out. I have to think about things that make sense in my little mind. <laughs> what's dragging out the death? <laughs> You know. So like kidney disease, like at the end of kidney um, renal failure? Would renal that... failure, COPD, this, that, and the other. We're not talking about somebody that has an abscess on their back. That's not morbidity. But 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 I'm not going to nitpick because I don't think that's like that's the top thing you should. But you should know what, what is, what's the difference so that if you should see it again. Okay, so then I know a screen is kind of kind of small, but again, this, we're going to share this. We're going to go through it. So data generation is the process of developing. Let me move this. Out. I can't read my own screen. It's the process of identifying data. Okay. Uh, process of developing data that do not already exist through interaction with the community. So this is a, this one is a little bit different. This is more of their, um, what are their values? What are their um, beliefs? What are their social norms? Uh, let me give you an example. They believe, and I'm, I'm completely making this up. They believe that if the sun comes up on the left side of the tree, then they shouldn't go to the doctor. I'm just saying. People have different uh, beliefs and you, are not there to change folks. You just need to know what their who what their norms are. What are their customs? What are their their values? I can tell you from working with an indigenous remote um, Native American community for fifteen years, this was huge. And knowing what what values are important to them, what beliefs are important to them, and what are their social norms? Who's the leader? What's their leadership like? Well, who influences folks in that village? Um, what do they feel are their goals and their perceived needs? Because you can make the most beautiful, perfectest this, this program with a little pink bow on it. And, and if this is not something that they feel is important and valued, then you, you're not going to really get that far. So there has to be a little bit of a give and take when I was creating programs. But again, 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 you want to know the definitions. So data generation is when you're sitting, I say you're just sitting down with folks and you're obtaining information on what their customs, beliefs, and values are. So that's different than going, looking up online and finding out what their morbidity and mortality is. This is actually like you're going to the people or um, 
there may be some research that's out there which says that, but this is usually these are done by by conversations with with folks. Um, or again, um, you want to this data generation again is um, the key to to this one is that the data does not exist but is developed. So you're through your interactions with the community. So this is a little bit more personalized and I like it. I like them all because they're all, all types of data are important because you're putting all of this hodgepodge into a big old pot for you to figure out stuff. So all of these are important. Um, so keep that in mind. And then what I'm doing is like, I'm constantly moving this, um, the pictures, the the pictures of everybody because it's it covers like my arrows. All right. So then again, um, when you're when you're when you're looking at the healthcare delivery system, all right. Let's look at it from a primary point. Again. Um, primary, secondary, and tertiary should be ingrained into your soul at this particular point and what it looks like. No matter what angle they throw it at you, you should know. Um, no matter what scenario, it sh you should know what it looks like and what they're, what they're trying to do. So again, the first word is prevention, education about prevalent conditions prevalent conditions as it relates to, to the people that you're working with. It may change on any given, depends on your community. But if you're if you're assigned, you're usually you're, as a community health nurse, you're, you're not thrown all over the place. You're given a community and that you'll get to know your community pretty well. And so you're you're at the very least, these are things that it should look like if you're focusing on primary um, prevention, all right? You're educating them, you're doing your vaccines, um, outpatient services, you may get it, you, you usually, you'll get referrals, you'll get referrals from um, hospitals and doctor's offices this as well. Public health nurses do receive referrals for, usually I would get them for, um, child find or a child is behind other immunizations, um, elder checks, uh, environmental checks, the child tested um, high for lead. So I would go out with my environmental health um, worker. So you can, you can receive uh, referrals from the clinic um, that are public health focused you're certainly gonna be working with your local health department. You need to have names and numbers in your in your phone, various clinics um, and rural health units. So that's just, you're, this, is a, this is a great example of like, you can't do any of this by yourself. And so this is, this is what you're focusing on from the primary standpoint. And then let's, All right. So secondary, secondary, secondary. Secondary is all about we we learned the world, the three, what was the three S's? The screening, the surveillance, surveys. Surveys is another another big one that some people sometimes will forget about. You can think of the 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 secondary from those three S's but it's all about early detection. That's why you have your mammograms and that's why you have your different colonoscopies, your scans. You know, we don't want anybody to have anything like ever, but secondary is, is focusing on early detection. It refers to activities and measures um, to, to detect disease at the early stage, because you know how they say, you know, early detection, what was this? I think breast cancer awareness. Early detection is good because you want to catch things early 
treat them, and then they never move the tertiary if you catch it early in time. But we're not going to digress there. But that's what they're looking for. You're when you're doing surveillance, when CDC is doing surveillance, or you're doing surveillance, and you notice in your cases of anything, um, measles, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, what have you, are going up. All right, you want to just jump on it and pounce on it because you always want to be proactive in um, in community health. I'm always going to educate. Education never, ever, ever, ever stops. And again, you're um, you're coordinating with your health departments and your clinics and your rural health. But again, you you also want to focus on individuals who already have a known risk factor. I want to complicate things too much. Again, you want to stay proactive. So if you know someone you know, has a strong family history of uh, breast cancer and you make sure they get tested for that, for that BRCA gene or what have you. That's, you know, and she gets her mammogram done early and screening. So is to identify and intervene at the early stages. That's what they really, really harp on. That's what screening is all about because they're trying to detect if there's anything that needs to be taken care of. And again, if a mammogram is negative, that's great. But a screening tool is all about secondary. Is all about um, early alert. Think of it as, as from that way. So unlike, I mean, tertiary exists. It is what it is. But unlike the primary and the secondary, which focuses on prevention, preventing the onset of disease. So that's your primary, detecting early. That's your secondary. Tertiary is all about, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> so we have to deal with it. And that's perfectly fine. Um, think of that as your mor morbidity part. And you don't want it to get to the other M. So, because once you're diagnosed with, let's just say diabetes, it doesn't... It doesn't matter. That's not the word I want to use. Even if you are on insulin and then you're on pills and all of a sudden you're diet controlled, you still have diabetes. It doesn't like, you don't have a little diabetes. It doesn't go away. You have it. And once that's why like I really pounced on pre-diabetes because I don't want you to get to, because once you get to that, then yeah, I mean, you're controlling the, um, you can controlling complications. You want them to have the longest life possible. And now it sounds like, mm, but, but there again, it's concerned with managing and improving the quality of life for individuals who already have a diagnosed condition, okay? And then you want to reduce the progression of the disease. So again, that's why early detection is important. You can't physically like reduce it, but you again, these are that's where the education piece, getting folks to their doctor's appointments, that sort of thing, alleviating symptoms, you know, as far as, you know, these are these are non-medication things that you can do, you know, acupuncture, this, that, and the other. So you want them to have the best possible life as and enhancing their overall health and well-being. Um, but this is this, of course, not gonna say of course, it often involves medical interventions, rehab programs, which is not necessarily community health focused, but this is kind of like where your case management comes in piece to make sure folks are getting connected to the services they need. Um, rehab, specialized care, whatever equipment they need for their COPD. And so the providers on this piece are usually more of your, your hospitals, of course, your medical centers, your hospitals, everything, the providers is hospital, 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 hospital. So they're, and your part is to make be that case management piece as well. So that's really where case management does its best is that that tertiary management. So again, health promotion, keep that important 
important part of community health nursing. There's so many things you're keeping in the back of your brain, primary, secondary, and tertiary, but we, the process of enabling people to increase control of their health. I can talk all day long, but there's some things that you have to do because I can't do it for you and I'm not going to be with you forever, ever, forever, ever. Um, to improve their health. So then, so then that's that's that piece that um that you do, that in a perfect world that the, the community health, public health nurse really wants to happen. And when you're doing that education piece, that health promotion, and you come back days, weeks later, and you're seeing them eating a healthy breakfast of oatmeal and blueberries and you know like it's nothing and beforehand they had a hot pocket or something or ramen um so so that's what we're doing at whatever level we're never giving up on health promotion so it's a behavior motivated by the desire so you have to have the desire i cannot put that desire in your heart um to increase well-being and actualize human health potential. So, so it's me promoting health and you taking that information and like, you know, I'm just gonna give this a try. I'm just gonna go one week without sodas and just, just see, see how it goes. I'm gonna give it a try. All right, so now let's switch to a little bit about environmental health. So, when you're going out to someone's home, you're always um, you're always on a lookout for things that uh, in the environment that can cause injury or harm. You know, you're not going around like. But a big thing for me are those throw rugs, um, and you this slide is just an example. It's nothing you have to memorize like this different thing but just example so so there's usually when i would go out and do an environmental health sex uh, ass assessment um there was always this form that was that that made sure that i covered everything so this is an example of a form but the whole point in environmental health risk are you're looking for factors that can remember you're trying to promote health that can cause disease or injury um, from the home or even work as well. This is a this is a home one. But again, if you are an occupational health nurse, which is a quasi form of community health because your work your your community is the workers, there's um, there are definitely exposures for work and community. So you're looking at you know what is are they what when was the home built? then you might may need to get them tested for lead. You're looking at the, do they have well water? You're looking for different things. Or is there a fire extinguisher in the home? Even such things as um, you would think like storing medication, preparing of the food. Are you seeing food that's out? Because at the end of the day, we're, we're, when you, um, when you're doing any type of assessment, whether it's environment or what have you, um, you want to do it in a respectful manner because you're in their home. And then um, you want to share that information. And then you want to work with whomever in the community. Um, again, I, I go to my reservation because, you know, they had programs in place to help folks get um, indoor plumbing. Some folks still have outhouses and we don't judge. Um, but um, they had programs in place that would, would help get that for them for free and repairing their roof and um, different things as well. So that's another important piece of your community health nurse. Now you can probably see why this is like such a specialized area. So then you guys, let's let's take a look at our, we're gonna go into we're gonna go into Epi land a little bit here. And then we're gonna um delve into the, our 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 epi triangle. So when you're when you're looking at um how disease happens, it's 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 complex in nature, but certain things have to be in place. 
you have to have your host, which is your living entity, right? Can be your human, your your animals or what have you. You have to have an agent, okay? Which is your your bacteria, your viruses or what have you. And then the environment. So what is the environment like? What is the environment? Is it um, is it the air? Is it is it the, um, the water? What is it that's um, that is influencing disease? Okay, and so with this particular here, you have the agent, which is the some form of bacteria. I, and it can come from any different source here. They're looking at the water. They're looking at this, this mouse. It gets inside the, the person. And then direct contact. It can be by droplets. It can be by a mosquito bite. It can be by airborne. It could be by you ingesting something as the mode of transmission. And then one of my favorite pieces of the triangle to work on, of course, is the host is us and 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 susceptible people, your folks with chronic conditions and um, children and your vulnerable population. These are things that you can really really focus on um, to to make sure the disease or help to make sure that that they do not succumb to COVID or what have you. Getting them the vaccines and everything that they need to be um, free of disease. But going really kind of deeper into it, you know, epidemiology. Yes. I'm sorry. I get confused between um, the physical agents and the environment. I feel like they're like the same thing. Yeah, I mean, what the, you, the agent. Hmm. The agent is the thing that's causing this disease. Okay. You have your agent and your host and you have your, your environment. So, so the agent is the one that's, that's causing the disease. It's that entity, that thing. And the environment could be your home. It could be your school. It can be, um, it's not the actual thing that's causing the disease. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Yes, is my environment. And 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 that's where you you don't want to. I, I I like this picture because it kind of really it shows you yeah, the host is easy. Those are the people. Agent is the little bugs and the environment are as, as you can see a city behind you. You can see um, it's it's wherever you are. Your school is your environment. Your um, it's a thing where. I guess the agent and the host are living things. So, so in order for disease to occur, it's a complex relationship, all right, among um, the agent, susceptible person. I like the way they use susceptible because if you're not susceptible, I mean, you have a healthy immune system. Again, I think I mentioned this in my class. I know folks to this day who never got COVID. And I'm like, why? I had it once, but I think my, my daughter brought her home. She tried to, she tried to take me out. I'm just kidding. But but no, seriously though, but susceptible hope person. So not everybody, that's where you ever somebody had a question. I thought I heard some. That's where you when when people ask, how come? All the people in the house got sick, but Lisa, for example, we all ate the same food. You know how people say that sometimes? Professor? Yeah. Hey, Megan. B. Hey. Hey. Um, so when, uh, during the height of COVID, I was on ICU step down and we had nothing but COVID patients. Um, and so you would have a family who like say, Mom got COVID, tested positive, but the only 
uh, symptoms she had was she lost taste and smell and she was tired. Dad didn't get COVID at all. Oldest daughter gets COVID, ends up in ICU on a ventilator because that's how her body reacted. So I actually made it pretty far into COVID before I got it from work. Uh -huh. And um, my ex, um, she got it, just lost taste and smell and was super tired. Our teenage daughter never got it at all. I got it so bad, I ended up inpatient for 14 days and I almost died. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, no. yeah, I was I was off work for almost six months. I was on oxygen for like four months. Like it was really bad. But um, you we would see it all the time where a family, every person in the family got it at a different intensity. Yes, yes. And we still don't know why. And we still don't know why. And that's a perfect, per first of all, thank you for sharing. Thank the the gods and the heavens and earths and, and Buddha and all those people that you are with us today looking fabulous. I didn't get it from work. I know I didn't. I, I am N95 to the gods, but my daughter brought it home and then we all got sick and I was they were like ah, laughing and I was just like take me now just take me well because remember in the beginning at first they said don't wear mask and then yes. it was just wear the surgical mask and then it was we had to keep our same n95 mask for three days three working days before three work they yep. Gave us yep. one to replace it. so it was during all of that all of that um, so, I, oh, so I got mine towards the end but at the end of the day you guys here's the thing I need you to go out into this world and be amazing nurses. And during your tenure as nursing, unfortunately, that we may, there may be other, nobody had ever heard of this COVID thing. People were passing out in the streets and stuff and all of this. So they were, this is if, when it comes to Epi, if you want to unfortunately think of COVID, that might be a perfect example for you to to help with the understanding the triangle because you the agent and the host and the environment is that thing. The environment could be your your home. The environment could be your school. The environment is 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 everything that's not the agent in the host. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, because the the agent is a living has to be a living thing, and then the agent is is I don't say a living thing, but has to you know as a living thing. So you have your that's your triangle. So as a community health nurse. You want to keep that triangle. You want to you 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 want to to strengthen the 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 host. So if you even if you just focus on the host part, which is you, you know, taking your vitamins, you know, getting your. I mean, I'm just pro immunizations, making sure your community um, has you know your vulnerable folks have their flu shots every year keeping that heart healthy and strong because it's susceptible. So if the person, again, I can think of a couple of my friend girls that that never, never got it. Never, never, never got it. So changes in one of the elements of the triangle can influence the occurrence of disease by decreasing or increasing a person's risk. So of course you want to decrease that person's risk, okay? So for, okay, let me give you, I can, I don't have everybody on my screen. I don't know who asked the question about the environment. Well, let me just say this. When, um, when okay, when we were sick, we all had our little quarantine rooms. That's That can be your, you, you put that person in that room, in that environment, you know, I have a sick room in my house. It's not just, I'm like, you just stay in there. I'll bring you, you out order DoorDash for you. You got, you use this bathroom. I like, I'm not like, you know, OCD with it, but I like all the doorknobs and stuff. You, you wash the sheets and things like that. Um, I was the Lysol queen. And when I came home from work, like I would strip right, like right at the door. Right. Everything yeah. went straight in the washer. I went straight, straight in the wash. Down. Don't even change in the garage. These are these are examples of your in in controlling your environment. You guys have you guys done OB rotations? Okay, I don't know how they do it where you guys are, but our OB nurses they come in their street clothes, they go to the locker room, they change into the the, the green scrubs. Yeah, 
And then they go into the locker room at the end of the shift. They change out of the green scrubs. They leave the green scrubs in the hamper. They change into their street clothes. That's the environment. That's controlling the environment and stuff. So, so the end of it to, um, so interventions from, again, we're looking at, okay, that's wonderful. What does that have to do with community health nursing? I'm going to tell you, because interventions at the individual or the community levels, just what interventions is what you're going to do. You, in regards to this triangle, it must be aimed at breaking the link. So breaking the link between the agent, the host, and the environment, okay? That's what you want to do. So in a perfect world, the approach will be focused on all three factors, which is the environment, the agent, and the host, okay? But again, that's not all realistic, all right? So the point is, again, keeping your environment, when you have somebody sick in the house, okay? Or... um. Do I want to hit use like head lice? You know how they tell you to clean that strip, 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 strip. But but just whenever somebody's sick, if all this stuff from their comforter, I know it's a pain. You have to take it to the laundromat. I have to take my laundromat. Clean everything, vacuum everything down, clean everything, the bathroom, throw away toothbrush, all this kind of stuff. You know, when you have strep, throw away toothbrush, all of these things. That's your that's your environment. Wearing, you know, get on to this during COVID when we were wearing masks, social distancing, because infectious diseases are are preventable. So your effort should be focused on, on primary. Remember, we love primary. That's the most cost effective strategy because when people, I mean, it's it's expensive, <laughs> you know. And we're always about when I want to talk about money and healthcare, but again. Education, why it's important to get, you know, I don't want to be, make this anything political, but get your vaccines, you know, that's, you know, vac think of vaccines as primary, think of secondary as screening, and then your tertiary is treatment of um, wh whatever disease you're having, all right? So, okay. And then just know that this slide, you don't have to memorize what's on here, but you should know that CDC has reportable diseases, okay? And then um, those reportable diseases, believe it or not, even salmonella, that's why we get these public health nurse alerts or what have you. Um, and then there's, there's uh, TB risk reportable, there's your skin test and your x-ray, respiratory conditions, um, things that are um, you may or may not consider as a reportable disease. Just know that you're mandated to do so. So that's that's slide there. And then we're going to go into a little bit about um, Immunizations, they really, really, really harp about that, especially like if you're if you're working as a school health nurse, you're going to be giving a lot of immunizations, a lot of teaching, um, and then a lot of prevention efforts as well. So then consider like what are the what are the barriers to um, why you know some folks do you know do not you know immunize their kids, which is which is their right to do so. You want to um, always be respectful of folks' conditions. And then, you know, this slide just talks about there are um, prophylactic preventative treatment for the flu. Um, it talks about, I don't know if you want to need to memorize um, the names of the drugs, but just know that they exist. So if you have someone in your community then you can contact their doctor's office. You can get them connected to um, the treatment so that you can prevent further complications. Again, especially with your vulnerable populations, um, know that there's vaccines for the meningitis. There's the childhood ones that we, we all, well, maybe all of us had to go through and don't remember or what have you. So that's another important piece, especially again, if you have young children in the household, um, you know, working with the parents to, to know that like the health departments, you know, offer free vaccines, knowing how to connect people to get the um, 
any recommended, and there's a schedule out there on CDC for, for children and adults, the recommended um, immunizations as well. I used to, I had like just a notebook I would show folks. I'm like, oh, I know you're, you know, you know, this age, but it's recommended that you have this, 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 and this. Um, and then they kind of, you know, this slide here, I'm thinking they're putting this in so that you guys could know what, because um, people do have reactions to vaccines. Um, the most life-threatening one is, you know, stop breathing <laughs> or what have you. So you, you want to make sure folks, um, you always want to ask prior to, even if they've had a series of, let's just say COVID, you know, how did they do with, the, how did you do with your second one, your first one, that sort of thing, and what have you. Um, sometimes it takes, um, unfortunately, time for reactions to occur. People forget that that skin reactions, hives, and what have you is considered an allergic reaction. So you would want to um, consult before you give that. So I'm thinking that's why uh, Ford has put that in. Not sure. But anyway, skin reactions is a reaction. And then um, this slide really just talks a lot about theirs, vaccine adverse event reporting system. So it is a national surveillance, which is secondary <laughs> program um, to detect unusual reporting patterns. And so um, anybody can report. Most people don't know it exists. You can, patients, families. Um, the key is, is that it is not designed as, yep, 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 that vaccine caused you to have, you know, um, cerebral palsy or whatever. No, you're just reporting. And somebody behind the scenes that the government is doing something about it. So it's passive surveillance, meaning it relies on people sending in reports for their experiencing after the vaccination. I remember when we were getting COVID, I don't know what you guys, um, my job was like, um, gave me this information to, the CDC would text me every, like, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Report one, report two. So if, if there's um, healthcare providers and vaccine manufacturers are required by law to report certain events after vaccination. So if someone has an adverse event at your clinic, that's that's the important piece. Like people can do what they want to do, but as healthcare providers, we're held to a certain standard and certain things you are mandated to do. Um, you know, and that's why we write down lot numbers and all that stuff so we can so they can trace people and what happened. But anyway, your mandated report it. Um, if you see it and it occurs, I don't want to get into that too much. I think maybe twice I've had to do it in clinic. That's why we have folks sit around and wait. And this, so <clears throat> my kombucha went down the wrong way. <laughs> so if fans detects a pattern of adverse events and uh, following vaccine, um, they will conduct follow-up studies. I've never been a part of a, an act of fairs. But they actually won't be like, oh, okay, you know, 10,000 people had hives. We're not going to do anything. They actually will take this information. Somebody will do something with it. All right. We're going to run a little bit quickly over the flu. Um, there's a couple of different conditions that's listed here. We have 55 slides and I'm on 18. <laughs> so I'm going to stop talking as much, but I love to talk. I can't help it. All right. The flu. You guys can go back and look at this later. The incubation period for flu is one to four days, anthrax, antivirus, TB, SARS. They have this here for a reason. No way. Moving on. Um, they talked about SARS, which is a severe acute respiratory syndrome. I remember when they, we all were, well, maybe we all were, emerged in China in 2000s. Um, talks a little bit about that there. So there's information on it because SARS, um, COVID-19 is part of the SARS family. I don't know if they're kissing cousins or whatever, but that's just something you would want to know. And then the symptoms, just like Ms. Brombaugh talked about and I talked about, I never lost my taste of spell, smell, but I had some other stuff that just was not cute. Um, and I was transmitted. 
And then again, influenza A and B, um, the symptoms are listed here for you. Uh, whenever I think of conditions like any of any condition, I'm, I'm always thinking of my vulnerable people, my children, my elderly, my immunocompromised and what have you. Can be severe or deadly for children. Oh, look, see, I was just talking and I didn't even know that was on. Look at the red. Red is important. Red is stuff you want to know. Um, just a slide on TV. Moving on with our life. Zika. Oh, you know what? That is le a legit Zika baby. I'm just letting y'all know where the mom was pregnant. We still love you, Buki. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So microcephalophily in the fetus, that's that cutie right there. Premature birth. Um, so again, again, um, it's mosquito born. So one of my pregnant women are coming in and they're seeing me like, Miss Harris, Howard, I want to go to some place. And I'm like, um, let me look it up. That area has a increase in Zika. Da, 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 da. I think you need to sit down somewhere. <laughs> Can you go to Disney World? All right. And just teach, you know, where, where, where um, sunscreen stuff. So dengue is another mosquito born. Maybe the appearance of flu. A lot of things like uh, have mimic flu-like symptoms. And you're like, uh, your, your goal is not to diagnose. Your goal is just to be awareness and start calling people and getting things done. Um, so dengue is listed there for you. Feel free to review it at your pleasure. Lyme is another tick-borne. So we have tick-borne, tick-borne, tick-borne. You guys are getting to trend here things. Um, again, it's the most common tick-borne. I know a couple of people that have had Lyme, all right? She's, there's, you know, I love when I see treatments instead of things that don't have treatment, they make me sad. So again, whenever someone has any, any condition, get them into their doctor, get them into the emergency room, let folks figure things out. But you just like, yo, it's probably nothing. No, you've been hiking? Really? Let me see you. <laughs> I start looking at the skin and stuff and checking things out, you know, do your assessment. You're, you can, your assessment can be done at the home. Nothing wrong with a good old head to toe. All right. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Oh, ticks. <laughs> okay. We actually had, I'm not making this up, a Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever outbreak on the res about a decade ago. Um, it's vector-borne. Ticks can take 21 days um, for symptoms, I believe. Um, and then usually what they do is we... we I want to get into too much. We usually like we'll circle the date of the tick bite and then count 21 days. And anyway, I want to get into that through the it is another tick-borne condition. Let's keep that in mind. Um and then I don't know if I'm pronounced as my ehrlichosis or something like that. I have never seen this tick-borne condition, and I hope I never will. All righty. Um, symptoms, again, are flu-like. It's just a lot of diagnostic stuff that you don't have to do. You just have to, especially if someone says they've been bitten by a tick or they've been um, hiking or somewhere or anything, just, you know, do your assessment, um, ask about symptoms, look at their body and get them at, well, get them at the, I just like get them into the ER, but I like to do an assessment first and see but but again this one is kind of gnarly because it can lead to you know death organ failure kidney and liver failure and all this kind of stuff this one that i can't pronounce just makes me nervous but i've never i've never seen it or heard about it in in practice thank god and then um all right, so let's delve into, I have what? You know what you have. You have an STI. So most STIs are preventable because it's actually, you know, they're transmitted through specific and known behaviors, all right? It is a public health concern. Everything's a public health concern, mostly because a lot of these, um, we're coming up with like resistant gonorrhea and, and things that become resistant to the medications we have, and they don't come up with new antibiotics every other day. 
So it's like, what we have for gonorrhea is what we have for gonorrhea. You know, it is what it is. Um, and then some of these also can cause cancer, your HPV, your human papilloma virus, okay? Your HIV, your HSV, believe it or not, there's a human herpes virus, a type of Kaposi sarcoma. I just know some of them can cause cancer. Um, the Vs, just think the Vs. Um, especially people with a weakened immune system, all right? Uh, that includes our patients with HIV. Many are asymptomatic. So folks, you know, I'll call them and say this, that, and the other. Are you sure? I'm like, that's what your urine told me. Um, so just keep that in mind. And um, serious complications like death. Less serious complications include your pelvic and formatory disease from chronic STIs and fertility. So you want to educate people. It's important to, uh, and I, I know I keep saying that, educate, educate, educate on ways to prevent, 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 prevent. Um, hepatitis C is the most common bloodborne pathogen in the United States. And hepatitis A is often silent in children, okay? There is a vaccine for hep A, Hep B, not for C. Early detection is important. Early treatment, get folks into in, in treatment so they don't move on to tertiary um, and prevent transmission all day, every day. So then you do your um, source con contacts. But again, that's, that's something to know. When somebody has something, you start asking questions. All right, all right. So then... We, um, one of my favorite things to do, I don't know how that got up there, is our um, eco map. Do you guys see a little white square over there on the side of the um, PowerPoint? Yes. I don't know how that got on there, but we can still read it because it says, what is a nurse's role? Assess income, assess patterns, trends, healthy cities, risk finding, goal settings, community clinic, financing, volunteer agencies. So, so your, the nurse's role in the community assessment, again, is to know as much about her community as possible. One of the things that you can do is something called an eco map. Um, it's talked about in your chapters. So this is an example of an eco map for a household or family. So then in the middle, you have everybody in the family. And if you look at Alice, she likes to go to church every week. She's um, She goes to a heart clinic. And so it's a, um, the eco map or ecological map, you can make one of an individual, you can make one of the family, is a, is a diagram of the clients or, what's most important, what's the most important relationships with people's groups and organizations and identifies resources. And actually, I don't think I've ever really, I may have done like a quasi map, but it's more for the client to help them see how things interact. So it's a visual representation, if you do on the family, of a, the family's social environment. Um, a lot of times they may use it like in um, like in counseling or what have you, um, but it's it's a it's a good visual picture of of what the family views as important and for their life and their livelihood. And you can you can do it to show them different things. So then you have Bob, who's a high school freshman. He's athletic. Jane is a Girl Scout. That sort of thing. So, but just know that it is it does exist. Um, we, we talked a little bit about it previously. Let's just delve into it a little more. The, the public health nurse, she's in the perfect position to work with the community. All right. That's what she does. She's a living, breathing community health diva. Um, so the population is her client. Again, um, the community assessment 
for a healthy community, that's this diagram is really, really important because it just showcases every little piece of that pie that you want to somehow cover. And I think your chapter 13 does a really, I think it's chapter 13 does a really good job of kind of delving in. in. You want to take a detail. This is your head to toe. Okay. Um, detailed stock of the community from the inside and out. All right. This is your head to toe of what it looks like. What, who's the leadership? What kind of economic opportunities are there? So you can help your assessment helps you to plan and organize and to engage the community. And you're like, okay, this is what we, this is what you guys have. Let's see what we can do here. You develop a goal, vision, and what have you. Um, it's like your nursing diet. You'll come up with. Um, uh, you prioritize your health issues. You develop um, your improvement plan, okay? With, in conjunction with the community, your nursing diagnosis, if you will, will. Then you design your programs, you implement, you monitor, you repeat all, all right? So this is a really good slide here. Just going into a little bit about the community piece here so we can stay on track. Just know that children have issues too. And so then, especially if you're working as a school health nurse, you may see a plethora of different things or what have you, but your focus is always to educate, prevent, spread, teaching hygiene, teaching different things or what have you, and just knowing um, knowing how to, you know, make sure you connect things with your parents, make, making sure that you're... Um, you're taking care of your community of school children. Again, you may see comments, just simple stuff, but the aches, the pains, the headache. You may even see, you know, diabetes, ADHD, pink eye, what have you. Again, this is your community. So you want to make sure they're as healthy as possible. Going a little bit quicker here, you guys, so we don't run out of time. Did someone say something? No? They, they have a, this slide here about acantosis nigricans. Um, it's a skin condition. I've seen it in practice. Um, it's been associated with uh, obesity and insulin resistance. If you should see that in your community, again, you want to start focusing, doing your assessment, um, healthy eating, um, insulin resistance can lead to prediabetes, obesity can lead to a lot of different things. Uh, but it's like a thick velvety patch on the skin folds. And then teen health, because you know, teens are invincible, they know everything. And um, but believe it or not, um they're they have <laughs> they come with concerns as well. Mental disorders, substance abuse, you want to talk about STI prevention wearing your seatbelt, I'm finding more and more in this country, homeless teens. Um, we, have, we have a couple of different programs I can think of um, in Arizona for homeless teens complete their school um, housing, homicide and suicide. So you wanna do your safety teaching, you wanna do your, you know, wearing your seatbelt, the dangers of nicotine and mental health as well. But these are common conditions that the community health nurse will see and needs to focus on. Again, going into um, education and safety, um, they actually have their own healthy people goal. Um, and then why is adolescent and young adult health is important. Well, everything, everything is important, but they're at that. I don't know if you've dealt with teens and preteens. I have one in the house now and sometimes. Um, <laughs> so they're just in that cute critical transition. Who am I? Who do I, who do I like? Who do I don't like? What's going on with my body? Why am I this? Why am I that? Um, I think I have depression. I think this, I think that bullies, this, that, and the other. Uh, so you, you, you know, as a community health uh, nurse, if you decide to do this, you will, you will have adults and then adolescents and children and, and just realize that um, 
there are organizations and support systems out there. Sometimes they uh, don't have a, an adult they feel like they can talk to. So you want to um, be that voice for them. Focusing on diet, as always, with peas, with adolescents, with geriatrics, with everyone. Diet is huge. Diet is a cause for a lot of things. I don't want to digress again. And then your community RN, the case manager, we touched a little bit about it again. So your case managers work to meet the health and well-being of the clients. She's helping to coordinate care. She's helped, she's working with providers, nurses, physical therapists, dietitians, form as she needs to do, arrange for transportation, get them to their specialty appointments, following up on home health equipment. Uh, that's that's what she does. She's managing usually a small group of folks. And you, you may see them, um, I case managed my high-risk prenatals, which, what does that mean? I just made, I gave them a little bit extra love. I had my prenatals and then I had my little, my my moms that were users, the, my, my, my few moms that were um, on, cocaine or what have you. I just, I just kind of like gave them extra TLC. And then again, we, you know, we can't feel, forget about our elderly population. Not all of us are blessed to make it to elder status. So again, you may see a little bit more of your chronic conditions or, or not. Um, blood pressure screenings is something I would go out to the elder communities. And I had an elder community um, house what they, they would bring the elders in for breakfast and for lunch, play games, different things. I would do different screenings, vaccines, um, um, do different presentations. Uh, I would even do foot exams on the diabetics as well. And, and then knowing your resources, you're always going to need to know your resources for whatever population you're focusing on. For the elders, if they live alone, getting them to their, their meals on wheels, nutrition programs, things of that nature as well. You may be, you may focus on the, un, unfortunately, elder abuse is real. People just think of little babies and stuff, and that's what mandated to be reported. You may discuss the, you know, end of life with them, whatever is needed or what have you. And then your home environment, always, always safety, safety, ABCs and safety, ABCs and safeties. Um, and we're still talking about the elders. And unfortunately, they are, they sometimes are polymorphed, poly, polypharmacy, excuse me. They have 10,000 different medicines interacting in their body. And so doing education and teaching, prevention of falls, how to be safe in their home, um, see all the drugs every visit and 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 some of them like to clutter and and you got to just remember you're always a guest in a home so always being gentle with how you're um making your suggestions okay it all starts with folks being comfortable with you if they're not comfortable with you then they're just going to look at you like mm. so you have your faith faith nursing and your hospice nursing faith nursing spiritual nursing, holistic nursing, the focus is on spiritual care in the nurse, spiritual care into the nursing practices. It recognizes the importance of addressing someone's spiritual or religious needs and or religious needs in relation to their um, physical and emotional well-being. So it's that, that piece added on. And so in faith nurses, nurses engage in activities and supports that, that includes, you may uh, visit someone in the hospital, they may engage in conversations about their beliefs and their spirituality, how that's affecting and how to incorporate that into their, their health, spiritual support. May we collaborate with spiritual leaders and chaplains in the area as well. Uh, so you're, you're meeting the spiritual and physical and emotional and all of that needs of, of your community. And then um, they, they, faith nurses, they really work to raise awareness among healthcare providers about the importance of addressing the spiritual aspect of it. They're really big on that piece as well. Where your hospice, you think of your palliative care, end of life care, 
but it's still care. It is a specialized field. I was a hospice nurse. <laughs> I, don't, I I did a lot of things because I, I never knew what I wanted to be to our, for the last until the last 15 years. So I was like all over the place in a good way. So I did hospice. I'm like, no, not for me. I'm too young. I'm not 20s. I don't want to see dying and death. Not right now. Um, so it's specialized type of that nursing and providing care and support to the individuals who are nearing the end of their life. Okay. You're definitely coordinating with multidisciplinary team group. All right. As far as the 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 providing the care. You're not, you you may have a so you usually they're paired with social workers and different members of the team. They're the queens and kings of comfort and pain management. I remember having a patient that was on over 300 milligrams of morphine at a time rectally. And I learned as a hospice nurse, there's no ceiling on morphine. If you're truly in cancer pain, you can go up, 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 up. There's no way you're gonna get addicted. If, if the morphine can match the pain. Emotional and psychological support all day, every day, communicating and coordinating with different parts of the interdisciplinary team. You know, they may develop a decubiti and different things. You might have to get air mattresses and, and, and keeping folks comfortable. Education and guidance. This is what's going to happen with mama during this time. You know, she may not drink as much, may not poop as well. Definitely bereavement. And, um, and then your disasters. Okay, so community health nurses, if there's a disaster in the area, we're, we're working on getting... Well, we'll have hopefully getting our folks prepared beforehand with different plans that are in place. But these are different types of disasters that, that may occur that hopefully we won't see. But the important part, if you're a part of disaster triage, is that it's, you're examining patients and you're sorting them out and you're prioritizing your efforts. I don't know why there's a Z after my efforts. <laughs> it was a late night. So, so. Uh, efforts. <laughs> and so this, so that's what you're doing. You're giving people a number, number one, immediate, red, one, delayed, two. So you, you want to, you want, you want to prioritize your efforts um, when there's mass, ca mass casualties involved. Uh, you you got to use your critical thinking and triaging skills when you're going through this process, okay? And of course, you're always after the disasters, you're providing education and, and promoting health and making folks get back to some type of normalcy. And our migrant workers, again, we talked about in, in the first few weeks of class, uh, pesticide exposure is huge. You wanna reduce their risk for uh, pesticide exposure. You can, you can certainly do um, screening clinics as well. Uh, musculoskeletal from repetitive work. So they may have neck pain, back pain, chronic condition, because they don't have time to go to the doctor. And so, so that's a huge piece if you're a community nurse working with migrant folks, and then they just don't have the time. They are, again, 24 seven, they're taking care of everybody but themselves. And then in, when in these small communities, a lot of the times too, they don't want to go to the doctor because everybody knows everybody's business. And so working with clients as well to access care because they still need to get their conditions taken care of. They still need to range for transportations. Um, they're far less likely to report sexual assault and drug use and depression because they're worried about what people are going to think. And so that's definitely an important piece of um, community health nursing. So looking to just going to delve into to, uh, to our um, substance abuse, there's primary, always primary, secondary, and tertiary efforts as far as any, any kind of condition. Remember, if you see substance issues, it's, you know, if they are diagnosed with um, addiction, then it's, they have a condition. Um, so again, primary is preventing the initial use. So we don't want anybody to ever use anything ever, ever, ever. Um, secondary, early detection, reduction of substance use. Once the problem has already begun, and then tertiary, you're getting folks into, um, into treatment and managing that. Then your substance use. What can be abused? Who is at risk? 
alcohol and chronic alcohol use depletes your vitamins, talking about smoking and vaping. So um, when you're when you're looking at substance abuse, substance abuse can be anything from alcohol to when folks, what are those cartridges that they inhale? Um, you want to know what's prevalent in your community. You want to work with um, leaders in your community, do presentations at the school, do your, um, this would be a great uh, way to utilize uh, a survey if you wanted to do your screening, your secondary that way, and then know resources are available in the community. And then our homeless or vulnerable population, homelessness and healthcare are closely connected and can affect each other. So homeless individuals have, they visit the ER more often. They have, um, they could be homeless because of a mental illness or an addiction or any, any reasons. And unfortunately, homeless persons, they face a higher rate of poor health outcomes, barriers to care to begin with. They may experience violence and malnutrition, exposure to the elements. So we have to have our public health hats on here when we're working with our homeless folks. If this is an um, area that you're working on too, know your resources and get folks connected. There's so many programs out there, so many different programs out there. And just know that um, it talks a little bit about, again, elder abuse is a portable um, abuse in general. People think of children, you're mandated to report um, you're mandated to report any, you're, you're mandated to report for children, okay, if you suspect. Keep in mind, too, let's move to our teens. They, uh, pregnant teens are, they experience more violence during pregnancies than adults. I remember reading about that. Um, people, uh, violence in pregnancy has been associated with increased risk of substance abuse, poor compliance with prenatal care, as well. And so you want to do your, your assessment if you suspect any level of abuse for anyone at any time. And then know that um, these things are reportable. So violence in any stage and any age is a huge public health issue, unfortunately. And then going along with the mental health. And so when I think of mental health, um, and just mental health and mental illness. There's when you're out and you're when you're out in your community. One of the key pieces when you're when you're dealing with a sensitive subject is that you want to make sure that your communication is effective. You're not judging. You're listening. You're not asking um, accusatory questions. Um, you're responding to their feelings that they're expressing. So your communication technique has to be great. Um, you're not uh, not therapeutic would be defensive and stereotyping. And realize that mental health and mil mental illness that's like one of my one of my side 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 loves because it's it's it, I don't think it gets the love that it needs in this country. But at the end of, end of the day, there's a lot of things and factors that go into mental health and mental illness. Okay, when when sometimes people start treatment, stop treatment, and you are there to be their advocate. Let's just that's that's your goal, that's your role. And um, when folks are ready to restart their treatment or to get the services they need. There could be a lot of different issues as to why um, things occur. And so we just know that we're not judging as well. You, and, and, and being in this wonderful country, you're gonna deal with folks from different nationality, different backgrounds, different from your own. And that is perfectly fine. Everybody has their own relief, beliefs, faiths, foods that they eat and just be um, culturally sensitive. And respectful. And then my love, my Native American folks, they are a time, they're um, often past oriented. Remember, we talked about in our previous class, which seems like so long ago, they're past oriented and may not be concerned about the future. I remember we talked about that. So when you're saying come back in three weeks for follow up appointment, 
that's future oriented. And so you work with what you have. I'm not going to get into how you would develop a system. I know what we did. Um, but just know that if you're dealing with any type of, they mentioned Native Americans specifically, so that means they want you to know that. Um, you just need to know what's what's important for uh, as, uh, why your clients are not coming in. Could be how they how they view time, okay? And then you just you you trial and error. You figure out what works because how they see time is you're not going to change that. And then you are ridiculously resilient. It has been my sincere pleasure. This is our last official class. Next week, you'll have your HESI, which you're going to rock it. The following week, unless Fortis changed things, are week 12, you're not, it's not a class. So the only people that are required to see me, and I'll log on for our usual time, is, is if you do not successfully pass. I, I have to record it. We talk about life. Um, but there isn't any class. You're not required to show up. And, and I will email folks if for those who need to see me um, for week 12. Or if you just want to say hi. But I usually just stay on for just a little bit. It's, there's no, there's nothing to teach. So um, this is our last official class. Thank you so much. Continue to be awesome. I will stay on. You guys have got to be future nurses because Next year will be my 30th year and I am getting a little tired. I am gonna stop the recording. Now. <laughs>